Hey, do you know where my portable Sony PlayStation is? Oh, what? That brick thing? Blood, it's perished, so I threw it out. What? We could have revived it and sold it for hundreds on Wish or AliExpress as a soldier game. Praying to it is, I take care of it. What? <laughs> uh oh. Greetings, thanks for joining our journey. How are you? Today, we're going to be looking at a battle between Sony and hackers that would lead to one of PSP's game changing underground apps. Some might say that the Pandora's battery brought forth the power to unlock the true potential of the PSP. Now, you may be wondering is there any truth to this? All we had to do was a simple portable Sony PlayStation hack and it would have been a game changer. You're lucky I don't sue you. All you dumb mans ever do is sue people and cry about things. Oh, the pain, oh, the pain. Do you bloody know what a Pandora's Barry can do? No, this shit is a Pandora's box. I hate this place so much. This might be one of the most unique and interesting stories in gaming, but to get there, we must go back to the past. <laughs> okay, no, seriously, we have to go back. So buckle in, pay attention, grab some popcorn, and make sure you dust off your PSP because you're about to recharge its life expectancy. The PSP was revealed to the world in 2004 at E3, released in Japan just before Christmas 2004 and everywhere else in 2005. It was a very respectable console with a decent library of games and had a good lifespan and is currently the 10th best selling console of all time. It had a bunch of revisions, PSP 2000, 3000, Go and Street, which is always a good sign of a console's demand. When this was released, it was similar to the time of the DS and was Sony's answer to the handheld market. At this point, we were into the seventh generation of gaming and Nintendo was well established with their handhelds. From technically the Game & Watch days, but we could just say the fourth generation with the Game Boy because that's what most of us might know as their first official portable console which is arguably one of the most important handheld systems ever, if not the most important handheld system ever. But seeing the PSP at the time was like having a PS2 in your hands, where the DS was basically like a Nintendo 64. Don't get me wrong, the DS is a masterpiece, which I do plan to talk about one day of a similar topic to this, because a lot of people might not know about the hacking world with the DS, it was pretty interesting. The N64 is probably my favorite console, if not top three easy. So understand, I want to speak nothing but great words when I mention it, but the idea of portable power in your hands on the go is an unbelievable difference when comparing the PS2 and the N64. The PSP was basically looking like reverse engineered alien technology. The N64 is the best looking console, it looks like an alien spaceship! But why does the controller have a third leg? Blood, it sounds like me, I'm an N64 controller. Pew, 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 pew. Did you get it because I got a third leg? Yeah, I got the joke. It's, you're kind of boring, you know that. You're really boring. I believe this is undeniably one of the greatest systems ever and without a doubt a powerhouse in the gaming world. Still to this day it's a really decent system, but mainly I think it's because of the homebrew and hacking scene that added to the PSP longevity. The fact that this console can be modded to the level it can is what makes this a worthy addition to any gamer's collection, even in the current year. <laughs> is it worth buying the PSP 10 years later? Yes it is! Is it worth buying a PSP 20 years later? Yes, it's forever worth it. <laughs> they had so much power and capabilities to work with on the PSP, both the official developers and the hacking community and homebrew scenes. The ability to hack a PSP changes with each revision and this fact has changed over time, so it's best to check the official sources to verify with your console. To my understanding, the PSP 1000 being the easiest and best to hack, even though it might not be your favorite PSP you'd want to hold, I really like the feel of the slim, it's nice and light. I think it's got a bigger and brighter screen too. It's an all around improved unit in every way. The goat, you can go. The street, hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back. No more, no more, no more, no more. Oh, baby, I love the song. In all honesty, I never played any of the revisions after the Slim, so I'm just joking about with them. But from the hacking tutorials I've seen, the 1000 is the way to go. Again, double check, it might have changed over time. This is from my experience. <laughs> the other two revisions of the original PSP come with some setbacks when hacked. Minor setbacks in all honesty, so it's dependent on your tech savvy skills, to which way you'd want to go, so it's best to keep it simple and go with the earliest revision possible. It might be possible to put in 
Infinity on all the PSPs, I think. Homebrew and hacking your systems opens up to so many possibilities. As I went over in the emulation video briefly, emulators are possible to install and the reason I use my PSP now. You can install proprietary homebrew versions of Minecraft, Doom, Halo and Oblivion. Doom isn't surprising considering Doom runs on everything, including your old landline home phone. I'm not sure which button is run though. Get off the landline blood. I'm trying to download some images of my cosplay artist queens. There's so many unique apps designed for the PSP from the homebrew scene. You can also do custom themes and boot screens. The talents of the hacking and homebrew scene are unparalleled, at times putting even the developers to shame. Maybe the restrictions are based on Sony's command, but you never know, the console developers might want the customers to have better options. And it takes the hacking scene for them to bring this stuff to us. I can't stop driving home the insane power this thing possesses, and the talents of the homebrew scene combined with this system's capabilities, they're a match made in console heaven. Speaking of console heaven, <laughs> it had a very strong 10 year lifespan in the market. Then it went to heaven and still to this day, a, str a strong afterlife because of the hacking scene. I don't want to make this a PSP review. I just want to give a small, quick introduction to a few things before setting up the point of this video. <laughs> and if you didn't know anything, it might not make any sense or it might just be boring. And we all know you don't come here for the boring, boring biscuits. <laughs> I'm a biscuit monster. Undignified. Blood, all we've eaten for months is cereal thanks to you. So, yeah, man, went a bit nuts at the sight of something that wasn't bland flaked corn. Cha! There are some downsides that come with the PSP hacking. There's a possibility of bricking your console. Simply put, bricking your console is self-explanatory. <laughs> it becomes almost as useless as categorizing your videos on YouTube. And this could happen while custom firmware is being written. Maybe a battery dies or the code just fails. This could be because you've put wrong or corrupted files to be written to your PSP. You accidentally turn it off. Various things could happen while installing custom firmware. Again, you might not understand what that is. So for those who don't, I'll explain again quickly so quick blink and you'll miss it <laughs> did i miss it fam i don't want to close my eyes because i don't want to miss a thing oh my eyes are hurting i'm gonna have to close them i can't hold it open no longer oh, oh, oh. modifications need to be done to your psp so it can read unsigned codes such as homebrew or emulation even backups of games or isos but that's another story this is done by making changes to the official psp firmware hence the name custom firmware or cfw for short this could be installed either permanent or not so permanent depending on your psp which is why the 1000 edition is the best one i advise because it's easiest and safest also they are super cheap on ebay you could grab one for like 20 bucks Sony would regularly update the firmware to foil hackers and the updates were needed to play new games so the hackers would have to constantly find new exploits. And it wasn't something that took a few hours or days so there was motivation for people to not lose their CFW. Even if you weren't using the custom firmware for piracy means, you might not want to lose it to homebrew access for your apps or for the custom boot. But you also might want to play new games so using a homebrew can come at a cost and you won't be able to play official releases at launch. With the PSP revision, Sony changed something on a hardware level that made it harder for hackers to hack, I think. But even though they have haven't updated their firmware since 2015, there are still non-permanent versions of CFW. So you can choose what you want. Anyway, yeah, to simplify it, even though it's not that simple, PSP fat can do permanent, most PSP slim, not permanent. Again, this might have even changed as of this year. You'll have to quick boot back into CFW upon turning on the system for non-permanent options. You can alternatively just leave the system on rest mode if you use it often, that's what I do. So if Sony done an update and you downloaded it, sometimes you would need to downgrade your system if you want to install CFW again. Downgrading firmware is a lot more complicated than it sounds and not really something I'd done as it was pretty much before my time of PSP hacking. Luckily if you want to hack any PSP these days it's super straightforward and it can be done from the latest firmware with no need to downgrade. Or as I'll mention soon, downgrading was made very easy at the later stage when you used the Pandora's battery. Finally, this is what I've come to hear about. Get to it then. So where does the battery come into all of this? The PSP battery could be taken out and it had a memory card slot. All of these things would be used for the Pandora's battery. So let's go back to the start of Pandora's battery. And I swear this time it's quick, super quick. I swear this time it is super quick. In 2007, a group of hackers reverse engineered a way to get into Sony service mode. See, I told you, quick! In service mode, you could do a variety of things. Install a specific official firmware or custom firmware 
multiplayer at any version you wanted, which obviously made straightforward downgrade impossible. Though, like I said, at a certain point in time, this wasn't necessary. But the main goal with getting into Sony service mode was to unbrick PSPs. That's why they were doing this. A Pandora's battery would be used to put the PSP into service mode whenever the battery was placed into the console along with the flash card. After putting the battery in, it would automatically turn on going into service mode. It was obvious to them this was most likely what would happen when your PSP would stop functioning and you would send it back to Sony. They would get the console into service mode with an official tool and fix any software or firmware related issues that prevented the PSP from functioning. Essentially, Sony unbricked your console. You would have to make a Pandora's battery yourself by converting a regular battery by using one of the applications they made, which you could only get into using custom firmware on the PSP. See, I told you there was a need to explain custom firmware. <laughs> I don't just ramble for no reason. <laughs> Also, what a gamble, right? Imagine you're trying to make a Pandora's battery so you can install custom firmware, but it fails and you brick your PSP too. <laughs> I guess you need a Pandora's battery. Damn, how am I gonna make one? Could I buy one on eBay? This application would enable a soft mod on the battery and it could be uninstalled at any point in time, but you would only be able to use this battery to get into service mode while it was enabled. To remove the mod, you would have to disable it via the application. This Pandora's battery will no longer function as a regular battery until the soft mod was disabled and it was converted back to normal. So it was best to have a spare battery dedicated to service moding PSPs. The hacking team seems to have speculated that some sort of technique was used by Sony to unbrick PSPs, which began the years of research from a very talented group of people on Team Noobs and CND, which was Create and Destroy. They called it the Prometheus Project. Their goal was to improve the PSP hacking scene and make this unbricker. They obviously didn't have the official tool to reverse engineer how Sony got into service mode, which is why they had to spend years researching and figuring it out. Absolutely fantastic stuff. These guys are brilliant, but not as brilliant as me. Thank you very much. Right, so let's talk about the ultimate hack, Pandora. Sony lefted a service mode into all PSPs. This was ostensibly for they could um, flash them in the factory without actually having to open them up and solder stuff onto the board. Um, and you could fix a bad flash. If you send it back to service, they could boot it up and fix the flash for you. And based on leaks from various people, this seemed to consist of a special battery you inserted and a memory stick. But by this point, the IPL would be reasonably well reversed, and nothing was obvious in there. It was doing any sort of recovery mode. And as that stored in flash, it would be kind of useless to stick it in the IPL. So speculatively, it's probably in the pre-IPL. Unfortunately, the PSP's IPL disables the pre-IPL before we even get close to it. So how the hell are we going to get hold of it? With a tool like this, it could give people the confidence that they could restore their PSPs if something went wrong, or if somebody put firmware destroying code out there. All they would have to do is boot up the thing in service mode and restore their dead PSPs. This is why you never get rid of a PSP, even when it's bricked, it can be fixed. Anyone who done PSP hacking in those days probably knows the name Dark Alex, which was one of the guys working on the Prometheus project. He'd done so much great stuff in the hacking scene for the PSP. The world of PSP hacking is so rich and was so different to hacking other consoles in many ways. You can essentially hack every console on the market, but the story behind Pandora's battery always stuck with me because I've never seen anything like this before or since. The fact that you could convert a battery for the system to become a tool that could repair itself and make firmware changes in minutes is beyond anything we've ever seen, especially a powerful mod that the average consumer could use. Well, technically, there was something else on the 3DS that was pretty cool, but that's a story for another time. Also, on the PS2, there was something with the memory cards. Again, another story for another time. <laughs> Do you also think the Pandora's battery was a thing of beauty and fascination? Were these hackers' skills impressive in their battle to discover the potential of the PSP? Or do you have a different opinion about console modding and hacking? Should service mode only be reserved for Sony regardless of what you need it for? Personally, I think the Pandora's battery was a blessing to the users. Because you could brick your console doing official updates. Listen closely, gather around. There was this one insane situation you two wouldn't believe. It was crazy, mad even, dare I say, unprecedented. I actually used to make money from this Pandora's battery as a service on eBay at one point in time. I know that's kind of shady, but it's not like I was charging crazy numbers. I could have just denied it, but I'm here with my heart on my sleeve, confessing my actions. There was this one specific situation I've never forgotten, and I still think about it sometimes. Some customers, they was like, I'm coming to you to get my PSP unbricked or modded with custom firmware. Some people would request for me to fix it and post it back to them, but most would come in person as it's easier, quicker, and safer. Not for the person, but for the console. Imagine I was Ted Bundy or Buffalo Bill. It puts the PSP in the basket or else it gets the bad firmware. 
Anyway, when this one person came in a car, out comes a grown man. Out comes a kid. Back in the car goes the grown man. Kid comes into my house to get his PSP on bricks and hacked while his dad sits in the car. What? At the time, I was really young, so I didn't really think it was weird. I just thought it was a normal kid going to a kid's house. I just can't imagine these days someone would let their kid run into a stranger's house to do morally and legally questionable transactions alone with no guardian for an extended period of time. This just goes to show how important this was. People would risk letting their child go to the stranger's home just to use a Pandora's battery. Never mind obtain one. I got banned on eBay for doing this. It's against terms of service to offer an illegal service modern service like PSP modern service. Is there a statute of limitations on things like this? Yeah, it doesn't matter because it's not like I just confessed it all on tape. And cut. Man was filming the whole thing, blood. I'm sending this to the cops right now, fam. Kyo, 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 kyo.